Welcome back to Ray TV. Thank nice you. to have your company. Um, it's been a wee while since we've been together for a detailed interview, so we're really looking forward to having your time this afternoon. So much to cover, with the most pressing area being the immediate position of the club, with aspects relating to investment. However, as is Race TV's way, we always like to start with a little sidestep. And the first question I want to ask you, John, is tell me what Wraith Rovers mean to you. Tell me about Wraith Rovers through the years and what part it's played in your life. It makes the difference between the people around me having a nice weekend or a miserable weekend. I think that that's probably the best way of summing it up. It's something that's always been there, always used to be there at three o'clock on a Saturday, but now it could be any day of the week at any time of the day for TV. Uh, but really it's Saturdays in Scotland is Wraith Rovers at three o'clock. How has your relationship with, with the club changed on a personal level as you've kind of elevated through the, the ranks or in the hierarchy? Because now it's not just about um, watching a game of football. The role that you have comes with pressure. I would imagine a huge amount of worry. And it certainly comes with a lot of judgment. How has that differed? It's not as much fun. And yes, uh, Robert Hunter was sitting in the stand with me earlier in the season and he kept saying, John, calm down, calm down, it's going to be okay. And it was, we won that day, but we don't always win. Okay, let's focus on what I think will be the supporters' remit for, for this interview and ultimately that's a, that's a prime audience. Um, I know you and I have spoken many times over the many years uh, and we've got a conversational style, so we'll, we'll, we'll go one way, we'll come the other, but I'm going to try and roughly keep us into a few kind of um, distinct headings. I'm going to start with why do we need investment? Um, before moving on to who might invest, negotiations, uh, what level they're at, and finally look at a bit of the daily function uh, with regards to life at Starts Park. So the first place I'd like to start is the kind of current financial landscape. So for clarity, for supporters uh, viewing in, can you detail the club debt as it stands? I, I've had a bit of a look around the kind of public realm, what I can grab, what I can gather. It's quite a worrying uh, kind of canvas to look at. £150,000 loss per season since uh, 2005 uh, and potentially up to £2.4 million in cumulative losses, um, though I believe half a million pound of, of that has been paid off. What does the picture look like on the ground for Wraith Rovers? The picture is basically the same, uh, and that is that in order to compete we've got to roll the dice and we've got to take a little bit of a gamble. Can we make the playoffs? Can we get through to the next round of the Scottish Cup? And over the years, we've lost on average about £150,000. Uh, and that's not necessarily surprising. If you look at the other clubs, it's not investment because it's very unlikely that anyone's ever going to get it back. Are, are we free of bank debt? And, and for supporters, I mean, how do supporters rationalise and process these ominous amounts of money that are, that are in the, the money leaving the, the club or needing to be the partner club? We do have some bank debt, uh, and that was because the government gave everyone £50,000 uh, as part of the COVID. Uh, it wasn't my preference to take up the loan, uh, but the, the board at the time, the majority felt that a bird in the hands better than one in the bush and we should take it and not spend it. Uh, being race rovers, of course, we spent it, but that's another story. But that's down, I think, now to about 35,000 and it'll be paid off in the next uh, three years. I think it was a five-year loan. Is ominous a, a fair word to, to use in reference to the money that's owed by race rovers? Uh, not really. I mean, it, th there are big numbers and Running a football team is totally different from any other business. Uh, but if you understand what's going on, it's manageable. I was asked by a young supporter um, who came and joined Wraith TV, we kind of mentored them for the day, um, a couple of things. And it was good to kind of see how a young person kind of was, was viewing the, the current goings on. The two points were, A, are Wraith Rovers going to survive? And B, can you explain our financial position uh, as, in his words, I can't make sense of so much historical detail? So in quite simple terms, can you explain what's the root cause of our financial insecurity? 
Scottish football and the way the prize money is allocated is part of the problem. Um, part of the problem is that we don't have a, as big a fan base as we'd like. Uh, that's uh, looking at it seems to be for historical reasons because if you go back in time we used to have more people attend than Dunfermline uh, but then Dunfermline went through a great patch in the 60s um, so we really need to focus on building it up again but it's not all doom and gloom if you look at the last three completed seasons uh, for two seasons we made a profit and last season we lost about a hundred thousand pounds if we had finished third instead of fifth, we'd have made a profit of about £100,000 because each place at the top end of the championship is worth £75,000. Then if you get into the playoffs, you have at least one home gate. So we finished fifth, we lost 100000 If we'd finished fourth, we'd have just about broken even. We'd have got 75000 extra in prize money and we would have had at least one game in the playoffs with the possibility that it would be televised. So it's not all doom and gloom. We had hoped to get through the League Cup. We didn't. Um, that's made a significant difference. So if you look at the, the accounts through the end of December, our costs are not that different from last year, uh, but our income is half a million down. Now that's partly because the Premier League gives you the money for last season once their accounts are audited in October. So we were, that was 150,000. Uh, we didn't get through in Betfred or League Cup. Uh, and I think that that's another about 50,000. Uh, and then we obviously didn't have a game against Celtic. Uh, and that's another 125,000. Uh, it's interesting that the number of season tickets we've sold this year has gone up uh, and the, the commercial department were over the moon. I'm an accountant. It's not the number, it's the mix. And the good news is that we're, we've sold a lot more younger season tickets, but we have fewer in the adult and the concession range. So we did some research and because last year they got free Wraith TV uh, and this year they don't. So for a lot of people the economics have changed. I, I can't always go to games. I don't always like going out on a, a wet November evening or a miserable February afternoon. But I could just sit at home with a beer and I could watch the game. But that seems to be the main reason that our adult season tickets and concession season tickets sort of slip back to where they were pre-COVID. Is there still the same need to move players on? We're in January, we're looking at um, our opposition bringing in loans, nailing down contracts. How do you balance that pressure? In terms of moving players on, uh, that would be the manager's call. If he thinks that there are some players that are not contributing and he would rather that we didn't have to bear their cost and that would be for the manager and the chairman uh, and probably Alan Halliday who uh, handles the football matters to, to actually decide. How have, how have we bolstered our um, recruitment policy then? How have we um, became more stringent in our research? Because um, you know, as I say the window is open. We started last year by subscribing to various uh, third party providers so that we weren't relying on the agent's video. And the conversation I had with John McGlynn many times was, I said, John, I played football for 30 years as an adult and I could put together a three minute video that would show that I was Premier League standard, but it's the other 29 years, 364 days, 23 hours, 57 minutes that you got to worry about. So we do have access to pretty much all the games, I believe, in England and 
to a lesser extent on the continent. The continent's less interesting now because of the work permit situation. Uh, but we, so hopefully we can get a far better idea of players because it seems as if a lot of Scottish clubs have had to go to lower leagues in England uh, and sometimes you strike lucky, sometimes you don't, you know? I believe that Ian is very comfortable with the people he's got looking at players in Scotland uh, and as I understand it and from previous experience everything seems to be left to the end of the transfer window. Now, the manager's got to have the call, final call on players uh, but the chairman has got to have the final call on whether the club can afford it or not. Okay. Let's come back to the kind of financing because you, you do mention there that for a championship club, you know, from someone looking on the outside, we've had the perfect storm. We've had £200,000 transfers, we've had a couple of games against Celtic, the TV turn up, we've had Aberdeen, we, we've mentioned earlier that we've had um, a couple of Challenge Cup wins. That seems to be that these are these are things that you would hope would happen in a the season, these are things that you would aspire to be, but I wouldn't imagine that they would be part parts of the budget at the start of the year, you would say we're, we're going to bank on getting through the third round of the, the cup, but drawing one of the old firm, drawing them twice, um, seems to be quite fortuitous, but, but we're still losing money. Okay, uh, again it comes down to people and personalities. Uh, David Sinton was with me in 2005, uh, was involved, he was the chairman then, and he was kind enough to come back. And he understands football finances, and I think now I do. So basically what you do is you start with a budget that you can afford. You make an assumption about where you're going to end up. So I think last year, sorry, the year before, first year in the championship, we said we'd be eighth. Uh, and then we were third, and we should have been second. And we probably even should have gone up, but that's just me as a supporter. Then, so last year, I think we budgeted to be fourth and still be in the playoffs. Okay, we were fifth. Uh, you then go into the season, and the first big thing is you've got to get out of the League Cup. And you can know that before the transfer window closes in August. Now, you may not be able to transfer people in, but you know how much you've got for loan signings. The next big day is November, when you play your first cup game. You've got to get through that. And then the second cup game is in January. So we go to Linlithgow. We will know the result of that game. We'll know the draw for the next round before the transfer window closes. So that's your second bite at it. Now, I understand that there's another championship club who have been lucky in the cup draw and they plan to use that money in the January window. Uh, and good luck to them. Uh, but we want to know, can we beat Linlithgow? And if we do, who do we get in the next round? I can remember one of the most depressing days in the Wraith boardroom was when we were playing in the Cup and we lost to Dumbarton and Dumbarton drew Celtic and you could hear the Dumbarton players cheering and Turnbull just turned and looked at me. <laughs> and that's the closest I've seen him to cry. But that's just the way it goes. I mean, aside from the, the kind of the checks and balances where, where how football evolves and what happens out in the pitch it clearly dictates a huge amount. We've got some worry around about the stadium. Major work required is the is the kind of um, buzz phrase that pa uh, supporters are passing about. Can you tell us, what does that major work involve? You know, we've heard up to £500,000. What's the reality of that? How pressing is that? What's the time frame? Okay. Uh, a lot of people had stands built in the late 90s by bar construction. Uh, there seemed to be endemic design flaws in a lot of them. So as we go around to other clubs, we hear the same story. Uh, when Scott Boyd was here on his first time, we had a problem with water, as I understand it, gathering on the top of the North Stand and the South Stand. 
in a place where it would gradually rot the beans, beams. So we had remedial work done, which I think involved putting polystyrene or something in to stop the water getting in. But if you look at both the North Stand and the South Stand, you can see they need painted. Now, when the Clydesdale Bank pulled the rug on the club with the overdraft, the club then went to Allied Irish Bank in, I think, 2001 or round, round about then. And Allied Irish Bank said that they would be willing to lend against the stadium. And that was why the stadium was moved to Starks Park Properties. Uh, but they insisted within the lease that the football club had to paint the stadium on a regular basis. And for one reason or another, that schedule was not kept up. So part of it is deferred maintenance, but part of it is structural issues which allow the water to, to gather and cause more rust than normal. Now, I'm not an expert in this, uh, but again, we went to an outside contractor and that was where the half a million came from. Uh, they said to do the north stand and the south stand would be half a million. The, the stands are the least of our worries structurally when it comes to safety certificates. Our issue with safety certificates, which again has required significant investment, was over electrics. And we've done an awful lot of work on replacing old circuits and breaker boards and other bits of pieces. Well, we all know what happened that night when we had the, the power surge. It just fried the distribution board. So that was the major work that was done, I think, over the last 18 months. But we now need to uh, be cognizant of the need to deal with the rust on both stands. So in a position that work needs done, it's costly what it needs done, but it's not going to affect the safety uh, license, and it's you know there's not an immediate sense that the, the stadiums and it will be inoperable. Correct. Uh, and politicians in this country love kicking the can down the road, but it comes back to haunt you. So we're we're really looking at it now as to one of the conversations I had with. Uh, an outside supporter, uh, I was wondering whether I should name him, but probably not, uh, who had uh, a maintenance department was, would they work with us to come up with a proper maintenance schedule? So that we know what we need to do every year. We know what we need to do every two or three years. And if necessary, we can start building a sinking fund. So in the seven good years, we can put something away and we can deal with the seven bad years as and when they come. It's an interesting um, set of detail you give. I can remember, um, ironically, a journey to play um, lower league opposition in the Scottish Cup and former chairman uh, David Somerville saying the stadium needs 10% of the, the income that, that comes in put away for maintenance every year. But the nature of football is, you say, we kick the can down the road because we also need a centre forward and we also need um, somebody to shore up the back line and you know, X amount of medical bills have to be paid. Is that really where we find ourselves? Um, that's where, where we find ourselves. I mean, this season is unfortunate in the sense that we didn't implement the plan we had. Um, David announced well in advance he was going to step down at the end of last season. And someone else had volunteered to be finance director. But they didn't really understand football finances. Uh, they came up with a proposal and we said, well, we don't really think that's going to work because your income doesn't come in every month. We've stabilized our income because in the good old days, cancellations would occur during November, December, January. And those can be the toughest months for cash flow because October you get your final payment from the previous season. Uh, and ironically, the longer you stay in the cup, 
the more difficult it is for cash flow because you don't get your winnings or losings till you get knocked out. But you obviously want to stay for as long as possible. So uh, Stephen, uh, as chairman, has not had the benefit of a finance director. He's talked to a number of people about coming in to do that role. Uh, we've had to draft David Sinton back into helping out, uh, which he has kindly done. And uh, Scott Boyd has been looking at the budget for the balance of this season uh, and for next season, uh, because obviously he got a lot of experience at St Johnson that's been invaluable uh, as he's come back to race. So you bridge me over to the next section where we're looking at m moving forward investment. You know, the need for investment, the need for new finances is quite obvious and clear in, in what, what you spoke about there. It, 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 it's nice to have. It takes us to the next level. It's going to be more and more competitive in the championship. And it's going to be more and more difficult for us to get the best players. So it would be foolish not to look at what might be available. Now, the thing that people have all been rushing around about, Silver Bear, came out of an interesting conversation that I had with Ian Murray the last time I was back. He said, John, we really need a reserve team, but I know we can't afford it. But some people have spoken to us about the possibility of helping us with the reserve team in terms of funding it and providing players. Is it okay to talk to them? Sure. And uh, the chairman, Stephen, also spoke to them. And this is uh, the group led or fronted by uh, Mike Delios. And then they had discussions about reserve league, reserve teams. And then Mike uh, had an opportunity with Silver Bear in Hong Kong. So they started talking about the possibility that Silver Bear would come in and invest in the club. Now, nobody from Wraith has spoken to anybody at Silver Bear. And I'm quite comfortable talking to investment bankers. Uh, I'm not saying I trust them any more than football agents but at least I understand them better. So I can understand their proposition, which is come in, take something, invest in it, take it to the next level and sell it on. And certainly uh, in the discussions that were relayed to us, that was a business model that they were very interested in looking at. And they were very keen on developing the stadium. And it's a bit like Field of Dreams build it and they will come. Now, maybe that's a bit optimistic uh, with Wraith supporters in terms of the scale that we're talking about. Um, so th we have plans for a four-story building in the North Car Park with corporate boxes. They loved that uh, because they really wanted to take a club and move it to the Premier League and have Not necessarily a team that could compete with Rangers and Celtic because they're now too far away from anybody. But they could sit where someone like Livingston's sitting, you know, they're what, fourth or fifth at the moment, uh, with the chance of getting into Europe. Uh, St. Johnson were, were in Europe. So I think that that's what they were looking at. But we've had no direct discussions with them at all. So let, let me give you a week before we come on to the kind of the silver bear aspect and, and what comes beyond that with other potential options. Let me ask a wee couple of practical questions, just so I, I can get a sense of the foundation where you're at. Ideally, are you looking to attract a complete buyout? Or are you looking at um, something that sees you retain involvement, a kind of mixed economy of um, local partners and international partners? What's your ideal? Winning the Euro lottery. Uh, and... We don't know what's out there. You know, if somebody wanted me out and they were right for Wraith Rovers, then so be it. Uh, I've been around for 17 years. 
in 2006 I said I would be out in 2021 uh, but Covid sort of delayed that a little bit uh, but we do need to look at succession planning uh, Patra loves the team but I don't think she ever wants to end up having to deal with it uh, from a, a financial perspective so we certainly need to look at some kind of succession planning uh, I'm happy to continue to be involved I've always said you can't run a football team from Thailand or from the US or or from wherever you've got to be here locally and it's interesting that if you look at Dundee they're owned by Americans but both the owner and his son are pretty much in Scotland on a day-to-day -day basis and they were both here on Friday night so you really need to ha have people on the ground looking at it day in day out Is there a required time scale for Wraith Rovers to have this investment and I'm thinking again I'm, I'm trying to make sure that this interview speaks to everybody and not just the people who live every minute detail of everything that comes out of the club and I think of that wee boy and he's the most pertinent thing that he was saying to me was David go and tell me it's going to be okay Wraith Rovers are going to be here aren't they is there a necessity or it, for, for that continued um, longevity of Wraith Rovers no, no, Wraith Rovers has been around since 1883. Uh, Wraith Rovers will continue. You know, Wraith Rover, if you look at, look at where Livingston is today and how many times did they go through administration? Look at Dundee, where they are today. So that even if I was captured by aliens tomorrow, uh, someone would pick up the pieces. So there's no doubt in my mind that Wraith Rovers will continue. Um, but I'm not planning to, to, to disappear uh, unless we have people in place who don't want me around uh, other than my wife and my preference would be to remain involved in some form if only to pass on from the School of Hard Knocks the experiences that David and I have seen over the last 17 years. The most recent uh, potential investors, you mentioned Silver Bear there, it's played out in a, it played out in a really public forum, in a really public manner, um, where you know, supporters are picking up newspapers and going on chat forums, trying to kind of digest what's actually happening. What, what's your reflections over how that happened? And, and technically speaking, and I'm interested when you're saying they, whether you mean they, the people who were brought in to look at the reserve team, or they meaning Silver Bear, is that option on the table still, or is it gone? I've been involved in a lot of deals in my time, and normally you don't see anything about them until they're done. Now, it's obviously difficult to keep things quiet and things get out, uh, but it was unfortunate that a lot of stuff was being played in public because it then means that people take positions that are difficult to move from without them losing face. I know you're going to be limited by confidentiality etc but can you give me an update on anything else that's out there with regards to any active interest in Wraith Rovers? Oh there's lots of interest but we get somebody approaches once a quarter and even today I've had Another broker say, oh, we can sell Wraith Rovers, we can get this much money for you. Uh, could you give us an exclusive contract for three months or whatever? So th there's lots of interest. It's a question of what's best for Wraith Rovers. There are a lot of overseas buyers looking to try to get into football in England. And their ambition is get into league one or League Two and take the club up to the Premier League. Uh, but the, the supply doesn't meet the demand. So in the case of Silver Bear, they wanted to go into England, uh, but uh, this group said, well, why don't we start in Scotland? Uh, and that was what prompted the, the discussions with, with Stephen. Have any other um, potential deals gone to any kind of sense of advanced level in the recent past? 
I'm always interested in listening. So uh, we, we've gone down the road with a couple of people, with, a, with American investors, um, but then they did get a chance at a club in England, so they switched their attention there. But I think that was what I call National League, but I think it's called something else now. It's uh, the one below League Two. And we've got, I think, about three people or three different groups that are having discussions but I know they're having discussions with lots of Scottish clubs. Are these all foreign investors? Or is there any potential for heightened local investment? I'd love it if there was. Uh, but to be honest, we're very good at frightening off local investment. Because suddenly people expect that hands will be put into pockets and players will be produced out of hats and everything will will be be rosy uh, and i know that that has put off a number of people and it's caused some people to decide not to join the board i mean stephen has tried hard worked very hard to to, to build a, a functioning board because the problem is that if people are younger, they've got jobs, and sometimes they've got jobs and families, and therefore the time commitment's an issue. Uh, and that is why, for better or for worse, if you go look around Scottish football, you can see that a lot of the boards are essentially retired uh, businessmen, and uh, that rather restricts their, their focus. In, in terms of any potential new investor, and the, the the regular interest, I mean, we spoke 10 years ago, 10 years plus, when you were saying, look, you know, I get at that point monthly or quarterly contacts that look quite serious. Um, and obviously they have, over the, year, the years, they've not been seen as being valid. What are your key indicators for assessing suitability uh, and motivation for somebody coming in? What does due diligence look like? What's the value base you're looking for? Well, the first thing is we've got to understand why are they coming in? And what's their exit strategy? Uh, and with investment bankers, it's quite easy because you know they're going to want to try and turn a deal. Uh, now, the, the only person, to my knowledge, who's pulled that off in Scottish football in my lifetime is Fergus McCann. It, it, it's not an easy one to deal with, but. What, what I say to these people is, you're not necessarily going to get an easy ride. The other thing I point them to is uh, Flavio Briatore, uh, who had a wonderful uh, interview with British Airways Executive Club magazine that unfortunately my wife picked up and read. Uh, where he said the easiest way for a billionaire to become a millionaire is to invest in a football club. But then he talked about how different it was from Formula One and how bad the Queen's Park Rangers fans had made him feel. Because he thought he was coming to help and he felt that he was portrayed as a villain. And I think what really strikes fear in our collective hearts is that we've become another footballing experiment. You're the pragmatist. I'm the emotional Wraith Rover supporter. We know that's how these things work. Tell me about the checks and balances. You, you discuss, you, you chat, but what, what are the guarantees that you would look, be looking for in terms of moving us on, or as we say, going to some kind of hybrid model? There are no guarantees. You, you have no idea. You know, the, the problem with football is people come in with rosy tinted glasses. And if you talk to any person that's been around for a while, you'll say level-headed businessmen go into the boardroom and stop thinking with their heads. And it's an emotional game. So anything's a gamble, you know. How on earth did we get into the Claude and Elka situation? I'm sure the board went in with the best of intentions and thought that this was a way of taking us forward. So. That there's no silver bullet. 
I'm not sure the camera battery's got enough life left in it for us to go back and look at how on earth that Claude Nielke no. experiment worked it well. Um, so but, we'll but this is what people have been saying about this reserve team thing. What about um, what about a supporters' voice within all of these discussions? We've got the supporters' director, we've got the Wraith Forum and such like. Is, is there consultation? Will there be consultation? Or indeed, no disrespect to those uh, mechanisms, but the people from from kids to you know people who've had season tickets for 50, 60 years, how is their voice heard and, and what's happening next? Well, we've had discussions with the Wraith Trust, or I've had discussions with the Wraith Trust uh, over a period of time about uh, the benefits and risks of fan ownership. And Alan has been kind enough to give me a lot of background information about what's happening at places like St Mirren and Motherwell, who seem to be Premier League clubs who have it working after fashion, and other clubs like Stirling Albion, I believe, and Clyde, as well as Hearts. Uh, but the Hearts model is, is, is very different. Uh, and. Certainly, th th there's a role for the trust, the forum, uh, anyone who wants to, but they've got to come forward with a proposal. And it's also got to be a viable proposal. Now, uh, I know a guy who was the CEO at a club that went to find ownership, and he immediately quit. He said it's impossible. Now. St Mirren seem to be doing okay, Motherwell are slightly further down in the Premier League at the moment, but their models seem to work, so what we've got to do is to try to, to learn from them. But you really need somebody to drive it. Is that a call to arms for someone to step forward? Um, I think we've been calling for, for people to step forward uh, for as long as I can remember. I mean, I know Stephen's been looking for people to step forward so that they could strengthen the board. Um, what particular roles within the board? Well, if you put together a board, you look at complementary skills, you know, and especially when you're financially challenged. So you want to have a lawyer so you don't have to pay legal fees. You want to have an accountant so you don't have to pay accounting fees. Uh, we're lucky that we have Susan Simpson because she has extensive HR experience. And mental health seems to be a far bigger issue than I'd ever appreciated in Scotland. And uh, it, it's very important, I think, that we get our HR right. Uh, we try and fail miserably to get the players to look at life after football. But we, we, we were working with uh, two or three. Uh, perhaps uh, the current role model would be Liam Dick, who is always adding to his skill set, uh, ready for the challenges ahead. Um, but now with social media being so important, you'd want somebody who understands technology and social media and somebody who understands commercial. You know, we've got a potential retail business, we've got a potential hospitality business. Uh, we've got streaming. And that was one of the interesting things that uh, Mike Delias talked about, uh, was how we could monetize the streaming of Scottish football and how we could build uh, a story around Wraith. And he felt that we had dancing in the streets of Wraith, the only team that has not lost to an old firm in a cup final since the Second World War. These type of stories would be very interesting to people overseas who get Scottish football as a filler, but they don't really know much about the teams. People have heard about Rangers, people have heard about Celtic, but that's about it. So sum up, sum up for me, what, 
What does that ideal contact look like? What does that ideal partner or investment um, service coming in bring? Passion. So you spoke about understanding of the community, understanding the balance between uh, bringing your business head in, but making that transition to going across the threshold of the the director's box and suddenly you realise you're wearing a scarf rather than um, your, your business head. Is passion the bit that overarches that? I, I think passion is very important. And also it's very important that people realise this just isn't a commercial operation. We spoke earlier about um, signings and, and one of the one of the real headline grabbing pieces of communication in um, one of the interviews recently um, via the club was about the potential need for cutbacks. Um, whether that be in terms of playing staff, whether that be players moving on, um, obviously that creates worry across the fan groups, the supporters, most importantly the staff and the players. What messages do you have to um, alleviate or, or add context to that wider story for people affected? Good question. Uh, you can't look at football in isolation. Uh, from the outside looking in, this country is in one hell of a mess. We have inflation at 10% or above. We've got strikes everywhere. Uh, people are worried about the cost of living. Uh, it's going to... our we were very lucky that we put the new floodlights in when we did because it meant that our electricity bill hasn't gone through the roof but we didn't get the savings that we expected to get when we uh, put in so we've got to look at that do i personally think that we should be putting up admission fees I don't know the answer to that. As an economist, I can probably tell you that if we put them up and the crowds drop, we'll still probably make more money. But is that the right thing to do? Uh, so that is why when Scott came back a month ago, the first thing I got him to do was to start preparing a budget for next year. And we're hopefully bringing in an external consultant who's had experience in the English leagues and in the Scottish leagues for the period from 1st of February until the end of the season to look at what we've got, to look at where best practice is, to identify the gaps uh, and see what might be possible, but to give us a, a proper budget for next year in the, in the same way as we had a proper budget two seasons ago and three seasons ago, but it just got, a, got out of control. So for people who are, I guess, directly employed and, and people who are in the playing staff, is there that stability there in looking at the kind of recruitment requirements that I'm sure the manager and the assistant manager got? Is there security, but is that matched with continued ambition? OK, this is football. As I understand it, and I'm not checked, but somebody told me that 19 players are out of contract. <laughs> How many of them does the manager want to keep? I don't know. Uh, you know, for me, if I was putting a football team together, I would start with a goalkeeper. And I was involved in recruiting Jamie McDonald. I spoke to him from Thailand uh, on a Friday evening. I remember it well. Uh, but you need a good goalkeeper and you need a good striker. Uh, so I would put my money on if a person came along you know, if you look at how many years Stephen Doby kept Queen of the South in the Championship, and now they're struggling, as I understand it, in Division One. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to guess what the manager has in mind for next year, but I hope we get a striker from somewhere. And in terms of um, the second half of the season, where, 
we're still within touch and distance of, of the promotion spaces, those conversations still to be had. The, there are conversations still to be had. Uh, you know, if you recall, Martin put out, uh, I thought, a very good press release a statement to explain to the fans where they were at the start of the season and they talked about they had told the manager you'd have to have a squad of 20 players and we got far more than 20 players uh, but despite us being short the manager will not let me sit on the bench at games so you, you know uh, if you look at on Friday night we played Dundee and Ross is injured Sam's injured Ethan's injured, you know, any championship team would probably want those players. They'd be three first picks. Yes. Do we actually want investors? It would be foolish not to consider them. It also depends what are they investing in and what's their exit strategy. If somebody wants to invest in the stadium and get naming rights, then yes, I think we should look at that. If somebody wants to build a, a building for the Community Foundation, but that's investment. Uh, if somebody wants to play with the football team, then You've got to look at it. I mean, Gretna got to Europe uh, and Gretna have a football team today. It was a hell of a ride. And whether Gretna, if you talk to 100 Gretna supporters of that era, would they have rather stayed in whatever South of Scotland league they were playing or would they have liked that ride roller coaster? Uh, to the top and, uh, and then back to the bottom again uh, and still have a team to go and watch. I'm sure Wraith Rover supporters would happily go in the European journey but I don't think the Lowland League as our trade-offs quite as appealing. No, uh, absolutely. So if we had, if Silver Bear came back in with, with a plan for investing in the stadium and for investing in the team uh, and then selling on later, uh, would, would that be the right thing for Wraith Rovers? Uh, at this point in time, I don't know. If we found somebody local who had the passion uh, to do it slowly. I mean, one of the things that I bore people with is I see at Wraith Rovers, the tortoise almost always wins the race. It's about being methodical and just going through things piece by piece. Try to rush it and you, you run the risk of it not happening. Uh, so you looking across your, your time with Wraith Rovers, what do you feel that we've done well? Community Foundation. We'll come on to the Foundation. That's like an, the, the, the next part when I say we're going to kind of break because we need to make sure that a, a, if we're going to properly inform fans, you need to look at the breadth of what's happening here, not just the, the, you know, the kind of elephant in the corner of the room. Sticking on that though, what do you feel we could do better? We need to work together better. Uh, but we've got too many mini empires, in my view. Uh, but again, we need that charismatic leader to make it happen. And that's not me, uh, certainly not from Thailand, but at this stage in my career, that's not the assignment I'm looking for. And, and that's when I come back to you said, how do you know you find the right person to take over? And I, you start by looking for passion. Somebody has got to have the passion to take this forward, not just on the football field, but as part of the community. And I mean, I can bore you all night, but when I was growing up, the churches in Kirkcaldy were full and now they're being closed and 
people seem to have more mental issues. This week I'm hopeful that we will have the, the Titan operating as a community hub. And initially that was as a warm space for people. But we've done a lot of research and the people going to warm spaces are not people who need to be warm. But they're people who are looking for company and they're people who are looking for social connection. Uh, and there's obviously a big role for that within the town, uh, within this part of the town. Uh, and I think the football club has got an important part of that. I'm not sure how long we can stay in here because I think I'm correct in saying tonight this is Andy's man's club. Half past six, the wee movement is out of the way. But I think that that's uh, the route that we really, really have to go. The, the football team is, is part of it. It's a glue that holds it together. But we need to look at ways that we, we can work better together. Um, that's why it's a bit of a disappointment that Paul gregg has gone to Hibs. Uh, but I understand why he would go and the good news is that he's going to join the foundation board so we'll have continuity and his continued input because I think he's done an outstanding job um, with his team. We're going to come on to the Community Foundation and I, I know there are people who have watched the earlier part of the interview and we're speaking about budgets, we're speaking about the money that was lost, we're speaking about the, the fact that cup runs etc still don't result in the finances adding up and people will be no doubt at that point shouting at their, t their TV screens or their monitor saying you're not asking the David Goodwillie question. In terms of um, moving forward as a club, do you feel that we're moving forward? I'm certainly learning more uh, and hopefully we're not making the same mistakes too often. Uh, but, but it's a fine balance between how much freedom does the manager have, how involved do the board become, and what appetite is there to take risk, and if it goes wrong, who's going to cover it? John, you mentioned earlier about um, a source of great pride as a community foundation, uh, and I did promise we'd return to that. I had the pleasure of you and some Emmanuel leave pre-Christmas to follow them for a week. and saw the real power of their work firsthand. Uh, how do you reflect on that journey? I've only been involved in the periphery, and I, I think that Wayne Carroll and... Paul Gregg must take tremendous credit for, for what's been achieved, as must the, the, the other board members. Uh, my concern is that the stadium has got limited capacity, and I know that they're using other facilities. Uh, we approached the council a year ago about the possibility of taking over the Randolph uh, facility because the Community Foundation already do it and we've not had a reply from them although I know it's being discussed uh, and we've had tremendous support from councillors uh, but not so much from the council but that's something that we, we need to to revisit because Certainly, we don't want their expansion to be hampered by lack of facilities. One of the things you said very, very kind of early in your, your tenure was about the fact you know the stadium's only used on a Saturday every few weeks and such like. Uh, the surface has changed, and um, I mean it's really stunning to see you know we, we boys and girls from eighteen months right through to the work with charity partners. Uh, the outreach, we've got the social uh, women's group, we've got the social men's group, we've got a walk in football over 35, a whole cascade of of involvement um, and particularly the work reaching out to the vulnerable in our community. You're speaking about the community cafe, you're speaking about the uh, kind of hot spot um, for people who need to come in for a bit of a, a heat, etc. Was that what your vision was at the time or has it became much more, much bolder than you, you, you dared to dream? At the time, if I'm perfectly honest, it was about changing the business model of the football club. And that was about saving money on pitch maintenance. And I think even I've been surprised 
at how good the surface seems to be. We're not quite sure why. It could be because we've got a rugby speck uh, on a football pitch, and it could be because we were lucky with the base that was recommended to us that we put in. Uh, but we still haven't been able to do as many of the other things that we would like to do. So for instance, this year, well, first thing was putting in the surface. Second thing is we had to replace the floodlights. One was because of the cost uh, of using it seven evenings a week in the, in the winter time. Um, but also the old lights uh, were failing and they weren't environmentally friendly, whatever. So we, we, we got the, the floodlights done. Uh, we noticed that the community foundation was using the stadium as much as they could, but the facilities weren't ideal. So we had a, a joint project with Stax Park Properties, with the 200 Club and with the Community Foundation to redo the, uh, the 200 Club. Uh, we had a project with the Jim McMillan Club to redo that. Uh, I think the Wraith Suite was upgraded somewhat. Uh, our problem is disabled access to uh, the, the main stand. We've got easy disabled access to the 200 Club and to the, the, the Titan, and we need to find a name for the Titan. But the Titan is increasingly used uh, for, for meetings and uh, other uh, events of the community foundation. So the, the Morton game saw uh, the Christmas dinner for Morton fans and, and Wraith fans, and that, that seemed to go well. So we're, we're making progress, uh, but we're only limited by the, the staff at the, the Community Foundation. To clarify for people who don't, who don't know, the financing of the foundation is separate from the football club? Totally separate. Helpful for them to, if they'll understand. What about the plans for the new community hub to be built at the back of the North Stand? We, we've had a lot of discussion about the finances of the club, uh, more money going out than coming in. How do you balance that with trying to put the best product in the park because it accesses you know, higher levels of football and engagement and money and all of this business? How does all of that come together with regards to plans for the community hub? We've all seen the, the drawings, we've seen it going from kind of two tier to four tier. Is it on hold? Is there a timeline? Okay. Uh, at the moment it's on hold. Uh, because we really need to understand what is the best way to take the Community Foundation, but also the club forward. Uh, we started with two-storey porter cabins, but we weren't that happy with our existing porter cabin. Uh, so we went for self-build two-storey, and then we discovered that it, per square meter, it was a lot cheaper to build up. But it never occurred to me, certainly, that we would get planning permission. Uh, and for me, the limiting factor was parking. Now, apparently now, parking is not important because we're all supposed to come on bicycles or walk or get public transport. But there aren't any buses going down Brat Street. Uh, and after we had the plans for Four Story, I started coming down here in the evenings to see what it was like with the existing stadium usage. And the car park gets quite busy and it gets quite dangerous with cars coming in and going out and other bits and pieces. So I said, this is crazy to try and build a four-storey. Uh, what would be better doing is putting in function areas that can be used on non-match days as part of the railway stand redevelopment. Because then you can use the parking at the south end. Because if there's not a match on, you can get a fair number of cars at the south end as well as at the north end. 
Uh, we have engaged uh, somebody who's had this experience of other clubs who built similar facilities to look at how would we finance it. And a combination of possibly grants, a combination of uh, bonds where you would issue, uh, and a combination of seed money. So that's something that we will probably start to look at in the second half of 2023. The planning permission on the two-story is valid for three years, so uh, we wouldn't be compromising that. But to be honest with you, I don't think we'll get the parking space for a four-story facility in that end. So a lot of kind of parallel planning, really, and, and this will be done incrementally and, and across various kind of areas of the stadium. It's a dream. It's a dream that we'd like to realise. But if you ask me where the money is going to come from, I have no idea. You're the only man I can ask. Well, I, I understand, but it, it, it can't come from me because I ain't got it to give. Uh, so we, we've got to look at other business models. You've been a majority shareholder for a, a number of years. Your input in the club goes back much further. What, what would you want your legacy to be for Wraith Rovers? I, I've got no uh, firm views on that. I mean, it, it's a privilege to be Wraith Rovers custodian. Nobody can own Wraith Rovers. You can own Starks Park but you can't own a football team. You know, a football team belongs to the town, it belongs to the supporters. Uh, it, it belongs to the, in a sense, to the league it's in. It, 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 it's folklore, it's legend. It belongs to the former players. And you can see how much that they seem to enjoy coming back to, to Starks Park. So uh, I, I'm just a small cog in, cog in the wheel. It's not really important. But survival is. I mean, Wraith Rovers will survive. I, I can say to your young friend, don't worry about it, mate. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 there were times when if I was an outside financial advisor, I'd say, yes, go into administration. Do this, do that in the same way as that advice was given to Dundee, that advice was given to Livingston and other bits and pieces, given to Dunfermline. But I know that our supporters seem to take a pride in the fact that we do eventually pay our bills and we do uh, not take advantage of uh, lending officers at banks that do crazy things that that's not the Wraith Rovers way. Wraith TV is um, obviously the club's official channel. Is the, the best place to reach out directly to Wraith Rovers supporters. You know, we know there'll be a lot of interest across the media world and across other team supports, but let me ask you, what, what kind of closing statements would you have for, for supporters tuning in, young and old? I think we've all been very lucky to have supported Wraith Rovers. Uh, you know, there must have been pressures on all of us. My uncle uh, grew up a Rangers supporter and he wanted to take me to Ibrox from the age of about five. Uh, but I was lucky that I, I went to Shawfield, which was my local club at the time, Clyde. And then when I came to Kirkcaldy, we, we, we came to watch Wraith. I mean, it's given me great pleasure during the last uh, what, 60, 64 years that I've really been a, an avid supporter. Um, the highs are great, the, the lows are, are miserable, but you soon bounce back and you get used to bouncing back. And I think we've got a great opportunity to build on what we've got. We've got to focus on how can we reach out to people in the community who are perhaps down uh, and give them another reason to be down, that we've just lost the last minute goal rather than the cost of living or paying their, their heating bill or uh, sometimes it's as simple as finding that 
as they get older they're attending too many funerals uh, and people who have been there for them before aren't there so they're looking for something else and to reach out to these people in the community because Wraith Rovers is far more than a football club uh, and we have failed miserably in harnessing the enthusiasm of volunteers. Now, what do we need to do to make it happen? I'm not sure, uh, but that's probably the main area that, that we should be focusing. Have you asked any supporter, and certainly any of these enthused volunteers that you speak about, um, how we would sell the club to a potential investor? Uh, the camera would be running for quite a while. Um, what do you think are our most attractive aspects? Why are we an attractive proposition? We've got a, a long history. Our supporters base is about 16, 17 in Scotland. Uh, we have got an iconic stadium, uh, which needs a bit of tender loving care, but uh, if somebody comes in, uh, we can certainly uh, continue to, to, to redevelop parts of it. Um, but we are an important part of the community and that's probably the message that we would have to get across to investment bankers. This just isn't a money flip operation uh, and the Community Foundation is very important, um, the supporters are very important, the former players are very important and Kirkcaldy I believe is one of the few places where we've got both an ice hockey team and a football team. And it's not always easy for people in the town to be able to afford to support both, so they've got to make a choice. Uh, and no disrespect to the Flyers, but I, I hope we can make their choice head in the Starks Parkway rather than the ice rink way. We we'll spoke about touching base more regularly and we we'll spoke about uh, maybe in time fielding um, supporters questions via Wraith TV. Is there anything uh, as we get to the end of the interview that you'd want to ask me? Anything that you feel I've not covered? Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's important that we can answer the supporters questions. And there are differing views at a board level on how much the supporters should know. Uh, but I think that if anyone's written to me, I've tried to respond to them. But I would be comfortable with uh, more transparency. That has got to come from the board, but certainly we can have transparency on how football in Scotland works. And then people can relate that to Wraith Rovers, as we spoke about earlier. How do we do our budgeting? You know, we've got a base budget. Do we get through the League Cup? Do we get through the Scottish Cup? Are we lucky enough to draw Aberdeen or the Old Firm or do we end up going to Livingston again? And these are the type of decisions that determine where all the residual money goes. And anything that's left goes to the player budget. The remit that we agreed for today was uh, when we met on Friday was quite straightforward and it's the kind of openness that, that you know, I'm, I'm going to routinely expect of yourself, and that was, it's an open forum. Ask me direct questions, um, and a reassurance that it wouldn't kind of destabilise Ray TV's relationship with the wider club. That was our remit when we we started out. Uh, I think in the discussion we've achieved that. So I want to thank you for your time and your honesty, John, and uh, I look forward to chatting to you again. Thank you.